Good morning. Hi, my name is Jim Smyton. I'm pitch hitting for Tracy today. Um, as you know, as we all know, Tracy pretty much hits it out of the ballpark every uh, Sunday. And we've had some excellent volunteers in the past, namely Gladys Gifford and uh, Howard Henry, who hit home, have hit home runs. I'm going to try it for at least a couple of singles today. With that being said, uh, let us pray. Loving God, we pause from our daily routines to worship you. We pause to recall your goodness to us and to all creation. We pause to express our gratitude for your abundant blessings. Free us, we pray, from all those forces and obstacles and fears that stand in the way of walking with you. Free us from our resistance to love, mercy, and sacrifice. Free us and forgive us for our failures and our sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the first scripture lesson today is from Psalms 139. It's verses 1 through 12 and 23 through 24 that I'm going to read to us. Um, if you're a reader of Psalms, this is going to be a very familiar psalm to you. Let us listen for God's word today. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So the second reading today is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 for 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, your commandment, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to the, him, you shall love, the God, love your God with all your heart and with all your might and, and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, we're all certain, we certainly have heard that before. I'm going to call our talk this morning, I'm going to title it, Are You and I Paying the Rent? Do We Really Love Our Neighbor? Now, having said that, um, first let me talk to you about and ask you if you remember Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was a boxer, and in the 60s, he became um, a, a um, rebel of sorts. Uh, he changed his name from uh, Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. He refused to go into the army. He became a member of the Islam faith. And certainly, well, he lost his license, his boxing license, though the Supreme Court in the United States did reinstore it uh, three years later on a technicality. He garnered an awful lot of disrespect at the time. But later in life, he uh, redeemed himself, I guess you'd have to say. Uh, he gave away millions of dollars to charity. Uh, he fought hunger. He fought poverty. He got known by most people as a pretty nice guy. Turned out he really was a sincere, conscientious objector. Didn't want to kill anybody. And when asked 
Muhammad, why do you do all these good deeds later in life? And he said, it's my way of paying the rent to God for my life on earth. So here we are talking today about loving our neighbor and paying the rent. Going back to uh, what Matthew's talked about, we've got Jesus, of course, dealing with the uh, uh, Pharisees. I'm not sure they were get bad people necessarily. You know, they tried to live according to their law and they saw Jesus as a rebel trying to tur you know, turn over everything they believed in. So Jesus is telling us how important it is, obviously, to love our neighbor. Now, if I asked you if you loved your neighbor, you'd say, of course I do. Uh, I, guess I would answer that for myself the same way. You know, we go to church, we uh, send money into charities, we work for charities. A good example is uh, the UPC uh, food pantry that numerous people work for. We're nice to people. We take care of the old lady across the street. We make sure her garbage is taken out and brought it and we bring her food during the pandemic. Uh, we smile at people in the uh, supermarket when we're there. And of course, we're good people. And, and I certainly, I'm, you know, I'm not objecting to that or I'm not arguing with you on that. We all are. But I want to take us on a little different tangent. Um, we all know that as we grow up from our youth, our childhood, we develop prejudices and biases that are with us today that we have to try to curb, of course, in dealing with other people. I think most of us are a little bit like uh, Linus in the Peanuts uh, character, Charlie Brown's friend, friend, I should say, Lucy's sister, I'm sorry, Lucy's brother, who said in the 60s, I love mankind. It's people I don't like, or maybe he said it's people I hate, but you'll get the gist of it. There's probably a little bit of Linus in all of us today. But my question is, how do you deal with people who are different from us? Let me give you some examples. If you're walking down the street and you encounter a young man who has tattoos all over his arms and neck and probably has orange hair, his ears are full of pierced metal. If you opened his mouth and you saw his tongue, you're going to see piercings in the tongue. And of course, he's not wearing Brooks Brothers clothes. So, you know, what is your reaction to that person when you first see him? Well, I can tell you that I was shown a picture several years ago when I was taking a course so that I could become a mediator of commercial cases in the Federal District Court here in Buffalo. And when I was shown the picture the first time, my reaction was, uh, this is a jerk. Uh, this is an idiot. And of course, that's not a good reaction at all, a very bad reaction, particularly if you want to be a me mediator and be neutral. Well, I certainly learned a lesson from, the, fr from that. What about homeless people? You're walking down the street, here comes a homeless person. Do you cut to the other side of the street so you don't have to encounter that person? If I'm honest with you, I'm sure I have done that in the past, but I don't do that anymore. Tracy and I coincidentally talked about homeless people a few years ago, and we both said we have an easy way to talk to them. We just simply pretend that uh, we're talking to Jesus, and that makes it uh, very simple to talk to them. We also said, do we give them money? And of course, the answer is we don't, you know, it's a toss up. But today I just tell a uh, homeless person that I encounter, go to the city mission, go to nights of uh, people of the night, and also uh, go to the library, central library, when the food truck comes in late afternoon. But again, what is your reaction when you deal with homeless people? What about a young woman that you now encounter on the street who is wearing a Muslim head scarf, um, obviously wearing Muslim dress. Do you treat her as maybe she's as if she's your sister? Or do you have some built-in prejudices there that keep you from, you know, being friendly and not wanting to deal with her and talk to her? Another example I have is you go to a restaurant during this pandemic looking for a good meal. 
and you get a restaurant who's surly, difficult, incompetent, terrible service, and you say to yourself, no way am I going to give this person a tip. But did you ever think for a minute that, hey, maybe she's got some issues. Maybe she's a single mother with three young kids at home and she's holding two jobs, down two jobs, trying to pay debt. Maybe it's a, maybe you should think about notwithstanding the way she has behaved, maybe, maybe you should tip her. And, you know, just again, we're always talking about, are you paying the rent? Are you um, loving your neighbor? Make no mistake about it. Jesus and God certainly love these people that I just mentioned as much as they love you and me. Now, I have a good friend who came over to the United States. He's from Iran. It was during the fall of the Shah. He recently gave me a, a poem. Well, it's not a poem. I think it's actually words from a song, four lines from a song of Pink Floyd that I think is very apropos at this point. We are all one. Strangers pass in the street. By chance, two separate glances meet. And I am you, and what I see is me. Okay, let's take a different tact and talk about another subject. Let's talk about how we deal with people who disagree with us. And that could be anybody. It could be some, a family member, it could be a neighbor, it could be a co-worker, it could be a stranger, it could be somebody who's not like us, it could be the commentator on TV. This is all part of paying the rent and loving your neighbor. How do you deal with these people? Well, uh, right after the uh, 2016 presidential election, I got a call from our daughter, Courtney, who lived at that time in San Francisco, who said, Dad, Dad, we got to talk. We've got to talk to people who disagree with us. We have to talk to people who have a difference of opinion in us. If we're going to bring this nation together, we've got to close the divide and talk to these people and understand them. And I was pretty proud of her for what she said. Not long after that, I read a piece in the Wall Street Journal about a nun and a white supremacist. And of course, as far as their views are concerned, they're on opposite sides of the world. So they started talking to one another over, say, a two-month period. And believe it or not, they became friends. And fortunately, the nun was able to convince the white supremacist to change his views. And the way the article read is that they be you know were still fun f friends uh, you know months and years later now what about the um, uh, situation where um, well let me let me digress for a second we're talking about trying to understand other people I had a situation in the office where I had a this is about the time that the NFL players were kneeling down and, uh, you know, during the Star Spangled Banner. And I had a guy named Jerry come in. He was a relatively new client. He came in, signed some documents. I thought he was going to leave, but it was clear he wanted to talk. He had lost his wife recently, and I think he was lonely. And the first thing out of his mouth was, you know, I voted for President Trump. And I go to myself, uh-oh, I don't talk to anybody other than my spouse and our children about my politics. I, I don't really want to get involved, but I decided to listen. So Jerry says, I voted for Trump, but I think the way he handled this situation is terrible. I also believe in the uh, reasons that these players are kneeling. I think they have a right to protest, but not just in a way that dis excuse me, disrespects our flag and the thousands of people who died to make this land free. It was a good lesson for me, and I'm glad I just kept my mouth shut and did lesson, listen. Now, I don't know how many will remember Stephen Covey. Stephen wrote a very successful book in the 90s called, uh, maybe late 80s actually, The um, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And the fifth uh, lesson, rule, whatever you want to call it, 
is seek first to understand and then to be understood. And the commentary that he writes on that rule is when you're talking to other people, don't advance your own position. Ask them what their position is. And then recite it back to them in words that you think uh, you understand what they said, and then you can talk about what your position is. This is not meaning you have to agree with them. It means you are trying to create a dialogue of understanding. Now, this talk of mine is not about Black Lives Matter, though I think it's a time, a movement that has come. But I want to sit down with police officers, and I simply want to say to them, tell me about your day. Tell me about your fears. Tell me what it's like to arrest uh, a person that's extremely difficult to handle. Tell me about uh, why you need to shoot people. Why can't you shoot people in the leg instead of the gut? Just tell me about your life so I have a better understanding of what you're all about. Also, I'd like to sit down with my uh, black Amer well, African-American black friends and just say, what's it like being black in America? I have no idea. I know what I read, but I have no idea. I want a better understanding. So, of course, what we're talking about here with this topic is trying to understand people who you obviously disagree with. Again, no need to disagree with them, but obviously if you love your neighbor and you want to pay your rent, we have to make every effort to... Uh, uh, understand them and see if we can close that divide. Now, as I kind of close up here, I want to tell you about the doctor I go to, Buffalo Medical Group. I go twice a year. He's a great guy, doctor, great person. We end up, well, he's absolutely uh, the Bill's head doctor. We end up talking about um, the Bill's always and also about retirement. Uh, he and and I both have wives that wish we would work a little less. And last time I was in, he said, Jim, Jim, if you and I are going to retire, we have to have a new pa passion. So I'm saying to all of you and myself, maybe it behooves us when we get up in the morning to say, yeah, I've got a new passion. My passion is how am I going to be a little nicer and love my neighbor more? How am I going to pay the rent that I should pay? One other quick story. During the pandemic, I was uh, listening to CNN on a Sunday, and, and there was a number of clergy, different religions on, uh, offering prayers for the mess we're in here. And, you know, the pandemic. And a rabbi, after giving his prayer, told a story. He said, a guy looks up to heaven and says, Lord, God, hey, this place is a mess down here. It's chaotic. It's, there's war. There's poverty. There's intolerance. This place is in definite disarray. When are you going to send somebody down here to straighten it out? And God looks down and says, I did. I sent you down there. So maybe that's another thing we can think about when we wake up in the morning. How can we... Do a little bit more, do our little part to make this place on earth a little better place for everyone. Amen. Now, as far as joys and concerns are, uh, the joys and concerns, um, let, I hope I'm pronouncing these names right. But I, we are looking for prayers for Pastor, I think it's pronounced Jesus, uh, Chewy. Uh, Galagos, father of Jokabid, and again, I may be pronouncing that wrong, and I apologize for that, who was here in Buffalo as a Presbyterian peacemaker some years back. Howard and Leanne know Chewy from the time he was a co-missioner at Fonterra de Cristo during their mission visits there. Unfortunately, he has cancer and needs a new liver and kidney so we certainly pray that he can find donors. We also need prayers for Gladys Gifford's sister who is critically ill. And we all hold people in our hearts that we know that could use more of God's love 
And we, <clears throat> excuse me, pray for them today. Now, our final prayer. Oh God, today we come to you in prayer. We offer prayers for our neighbor who we know, the neighbor the neighbor we know, and the neighbor who is a stranger for us. We offer prayers that we might love our neighbor. We pray for the neighbors who live in nations across the globe, who know poverty and hunger, who know violence and war warfare, who know fear and discrimination. We especially pray for our neighbors across the globe suffering from the pandemic. Oh God, hear our prayer. We pray for the neighbors in our own communities who are struggling with economic hardships and with racism and inequality, with poverty and unemployment. Oh God, hear our prayer. We pray for the neighbors we don't like, those who might call our enemies, those who, those who we might call our enemies, those who offend us and who do not share our values. We pray for healing and reconciliation, for your spirit to help mend what is broken in the fabric of our relationship. Oh God, hear our prayer. These prayers we join with the prayer of Jesus, teach, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us go to love our neighbors as ourselves. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.